I shall begin with uh, the blood pressure management and uh, the way to monitor the blood pressure while the patient is on treatment. So, sir, I would like to know uh, how is your opinion regarding the blood pressure measure measurement uh, office versus home measurement? First of all, thanks for having me here. And uh, you know, hypertension is a very high uh, risk factor for morbidity and mortality. And nowadays, we are seeing that younger people are coming with very high blood pressures at a younger age and they are also very difficult to control. And uh, office blood pressure plays a very important role in diagnosing hypertension because once the patient comes to the doctor, that is the first time he comes mm -hmm. to know that it is hypertensive. But we also are aware that uh, office uh, hypertension or office measurement of blood pressure has its own fallacies. Mm -hmm. There can be so many patients, you know, who have what we call as white coat hypertension. Right. That is, they actually have blood pressure which is in the normal range, mm -hmm. but as soon as they visit a doctor or they visit a hospital, the blood pressure shoots up and in, then we fallaciously diagnose them as having blood pressure. So in this group of patients, either office blood, uh, their home blood pressure monitoring or ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is a good modality to actually mm -hmm. diagnose hypertension. So home blood pressure monitoring, I think, plays a very important role mm -hmm. in ruling out patients with white coat hypertension. All right, sir. Also in certain instances of mast hypertension, mm -hmm. you know, some patients may have blood pressure which is actually uh, high and in the home environment, but once they come to the doctor, mm -hmm. their blood pressure is uh, in the normal range. Even these people have been found to have higher morbidity and mortality and target organ damage. Similarly, there are so many patients whom we label as resistant hypertension, mm -hmm. where we actually want to know whether they are compliant with drugs and whether there is an element of white coat hypertension which is added on to the resistant hypertension. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, home blood pressure monitoring will definitely play a good role in trying to rule out uh, white coat hypertension and mast hypertension and we will be able to properly label patients as resistant hypertension mm -hmm. and it can also play a very important role in managing therapy right because you know patients will know if mm -hmm. they take appropriate blood pressure at home mm -hmm. how their blood pressure behaves throughout the day so that they can adjust the dose mm -hmm. of medicines and they can adjust the timing of medications right sir so, sir, as you said, ambulatory blood pressure measurement has its own place in the management as well as in the diagnosis of the hypertension and monitoring the patient who are on the antihypertensive treatment. So, sir, uh, what do you feel? Uh, is it a feasible option to all uh, patients uh, which you uh, come to you or you recommend it to some subset of the patients? Yeah, I don't think all patients require uh, ambulatory BP monitoring or office or home blood pressure monitoring. You know, as I said, young hypertensives, labile hypertension, mm -hmm. difficult to control hypertension. There is definitely a subset of patients who would benefit from home blood pressure monitoring. Mm -hmm. Patients who are well controlled on hypertension do not require uh, frequent monitoring of their blood pressure mm -hmm. because frequent monitoring of the blood pressure itself in some people can lead to high blood pressure. Right. You know, because there are patients who keep on monitoring their blood pressure every one to two hours mm -hmm. and that can give rise to high blood pressure readings. Mm -hmm. But uh, definitely a role in white coat hypertension, mast hypertension and patients with resistant hypertension mm -hmm. and to monitor therapy in patients with difficult to control blood pressure, I think uh, home blood pressure monitoring definitely has a role and should be encouraged. The problem now is we don't have the right machines mm -hmm. and the patients need to be educated properly in order right. to take their blood pressure, you know, so that uh, they record the blood pressure accurately, mm -hmm. which will help them in and it will also educate them regarding their blood pressure and the way to manage it with medicines. Right, sir. So, sir, uh, do you feel uh, there be any challenges for the patient for using the ambulatory blood pressure measurement in terms of uh, the feasibility or in terms of uh, using it correctly so that it will give the correct reading? Yeah, so that's what the patients need to be properly educated. Mm -hmm. I said, as I said, right now we don't have the right machines, but mm -hmm. soon when we have the right calibration of machines, mm -hmm. Uh, the patients need to be taught, educated as to when the blood pressure needs to be recorded, how it needs to be recorded, what the record, normal recording would be, you know, and once they are educated, I am sure there are so many uh, now guidelines which are coming up with mm -hmm. home blood pressure monitoring as a way to monitor as well as treat hypertension and mm -hmm. uh, I am sure if the patients are educated well enough, it will definitely mm -hmm. serve as a good tool for managing blood pressure. Right, sir. So, sir, uh, if you see the ambulatory blood pressure measurement is uh, uh, still in early phases uh, as far as the India is concerned. So, what will be the future of ambulatory blood pressure measurement in India? 
No, I am sure. You know, as uh, the as I said, the, as the machines become more and more user friendly, mm -hmm. and as the education about hypertension mm -hmm. uh, goes to the masses, and once they learn to take their own blood pressure uh, at home with the machines, I am sure it is going to pick up in the future, and I am sure it will be a very useful modality to measure home blood pressure, which would be an accurate measurement of blood pressure rather than the office readings. Right, sir. So, yes, sir, in connection to this, one of the dreaded complications of uncontrolled hypertension uh, is uh, ST relation myocardial infarction. So, how, uh, in, how is the incidence or prevalence of uh, ST relation myocardial infarction in India? Yeah, I mean, we uh, have just heard Dr. Salim Yusuf talk on how South mm -hmm. Asians are more prone to have ischemic heart disease mm -hmm. and how ST elevation MI, you know, the incidence is higher. In mm -hmm. the Indian population, it mm -hmm. tends to occur at a younger age. Right, sir. You know, because we seem to have different risk factors as compared to our Western counterparts. Mm -hmm. You know, and so management of ST elevation myocardial infarction becomes very important in the Indian scenario, mm -hmm. where we have to take uh, many other factors into consideration. Okay. So, sir, if you see uh, managing uh, STEMI patients in India is a somewhat uh, difficult task because there are various challenges in patient reaching to the right hospital where we can have the reperfusion done very early. So, um, because if you see uh, that there are traffic challenges, there are financial challenges and so on. So, how do you feel? What should be the ideal time for uh, thrombolyzing the patient and what are the advantages of doing the early thrombolysis? You know, there was this great registry which right. was uh, about the patients of ST elevation MI in India mm -hmm. and it clearly showed that patients in India tend to arrive later than their western counterparts and there are multiple reasons for this, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. lack of education, right. diagnosis itself is delayed mm -hmm. and there are so many other factors by which the patient reaches late to the hospital mm -hmm. and so, you know, re adequate timely reperfusion becomes an issue in right. patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction. And not all hospitals are uh, cath lab uh, right. facility available, you know, so mm -hmm. it becomes a problem. We know that primary angioplasty is a superior modality of mm -hmm. reperfusion in patients with ST mm -hmm. elevation myocardial infarction, mm -hmm. but uh, not uh, all, but if you see the overall uh, percentage of patients undergoing primary angioplasty, mm -hmm. they would be close to 15 to 20 percent. So, there is a huge chunk of patients with ST elevation MI mm -hmm. who cannot avail of this facility mm -hmm. and I think in them a pharmacoinvasive approach, especially in the Indian scenario, would be a more practical approach to mm -hmm. treat patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction that you give them best of both the worlds, you know, rather than wasting time mm -hmm. in shifting them to a cath lab eligible hospital, convincing them for a primary angioplasty, you get them admitted to a nearby ICU and you thrombolize them with the latest thrombolytic agents like tenecteplase mm -hmm. and then make an attempt to shift them early, you mm -hmm. know, for an angiogram procedure by which you can offer them both the pharmacological mm -hmm. treatment on mm -hmm. time as well as the invasive treatment with an angioplasty by which you stabilize the plaques and you mm -hmm. achieve a good result and by that time, by that way you can both reduce morbidity, mm -hmm. mortality and you can also preserve the left ventricular function. Right, sir. So, sir, uh, so many uh, thrombolytics are available with us. We have streptokinase, the retiplase, ultiplase, and the newest one, the uh, tenecteplase. So, uh, what do you feel? Uh, which is the best uh, thrombolytic agent to suit for the pharmacoinvasive approach? See, nowadays, you know, I feel that in most parts of India, uh, streptokinase is on the way out, you know, because it is very cumbersome to give. It has mm -hmm. a lot of side effects, needs to be given in a 45 minute infusion, mm -hmm. has allergic reactions, causes hypotension. So, these newer agents are definitely superior in thrombolysis where they require a, just a bolus of injection and I think uh, mm -hmm. tenecteplase in that respect definitely outscores others because it has uh, less allergic reactions, mm -hmm. needs to be given as a bolus, causes less hypotension. So, in most of the ICUs nowadays in tertiary hospitals as well as in smaller nursing homes, I think tenecteplase would be a right uh, uh, thrombolytic agent mm -hmm. to achieve reperfusion in the less possible time. Right, sir. So, sir, in connection to this, uh, the concept of the pre-hospital uh, thrombolysis is emerging in India, although it has been well established in uh, other parts of the um, world. Uh, what do you feel? What will be the future of pre-hospital thrombolysis in India? You know, for pre-hospital thrombolysis, if you look at it, you know, the science behind it makes sense mm -hmm. because you will be able to achieve reperfusion earlier. Mm -hmm. But there can be a lot of practical difficulties. Mm -hmm. You know, for pre-hospital thrombolysis, you require a cardiac ambulance to go to the 
patients, mm -hmm. residents, you require appropriate diagnosis and of ST elevation myocardial infarction and mm -hmm. there are so many patients mm -hmm. who are in the grey zone, you know, between mm -hmm. non STEMI and STEMI, mm -hmm. you know, and so that you don't uh, thrombolize unnecessary patients. Mm -hmm. You know, I think uh, pre-hospital thrombolysis definitely has a place, but we have a long way to go in it, proper patient education right. and uh, we need to have the cardiac ambulances well mm -hmm. equipped in order they carry the right doctors and nurses who would diagnose ST elevation in time and thrombolize in time. Right, sir. So, sir, if we uh, just take care of all this logistic part and uh, some other parts of uh, pre uh, implementing pre-hospital thrombolysis, do you feel that uh, it will be like superior to the um, uh, PCI if done appropriately? No, I don't think uh, it would be superior. You know, it has to be supplemented by uh, mm -hmm. PCI. Mm -hmm. You know, a thrombolytic's job is to dissolve thrombus, mm -hmm. you know, but then we have seen so many times that uh, even the best of thrombolytics given in the right time, mm -hmm. you know, the chances of reperfusion is close to 80-85% mm -hmm. and there can be chances of reocclusion, there can be chances of uh, incomplete thrombolysis. Mm -hmm. So uh, they should be uh, supplemented with an early intervention, that's what the guidelines say that mm -hmm. even if you have successful thrombolysis, mm -hmm. you need to undergo an angiogram and an angioplasty if required within three to 24 hours mm -hmm. after thrombolytic agents, you know, right, so sir. that you stabilize the plaque and you mm -hmm. prevent chances of reinfarction and reocclusion. Okay, sir. So, sir, um, uh, which kind of a thrombolytic you would like to recommend if uh, even a PhD is to be implemented? Yeah, I mean, a thrombolytic, uh, you would prefer a thrombolytic which is faster acting, mm -hmm. which is easy to give which has good reperfusion rate mm -hmm. and which has less complications. And I think okay. uh, considering all these factors, mm -hmm. the ideal thrombolytic in this particular scenario would be tenective place, you know, okay. because it would fill uh, mm -hmm. uh, most of the criteria of mm -hmm. an ideal thrombolytic mm -hmm. as it can be given as a bolus, less mm -hmm. allergic reactions, less drop in blood pressure mm -hmm. and easy to give. Right, sir. So, sir, uh, if you want to summarize what uh, key three, four messages you would like to give to the practitioners regarding the blood pressure ma uh, management, uh, monitoring and uh, the pharmacoinvasive approach for managing the STEMI patients. Yeah, see, in uh, hypertension control, I think, uh, you know, if you are suspecting white coat hypertension or masked hypertension, ambulatory BP monitoring is a tool which is underutilized. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, if we use it more frequently, we will be able to diagnose more patients with white coat hypertension and unnecessarily give stop giving them medications. Mm -hmm. And even patients with resistant hypertension would be better managed with uh, office blood pressure monitoring. Mm -hmm. As far as the ST elevation myocardial infarction is concerned, if you have uh, the facility of a cath lab which is close by, primary angioplasty is the definitely a superior option in achieving reperfusion. Mm -hmm. If not, then instead of wasting time and shifting a patient to a cath lab eligible hospital, it would make sense to have a pharmacoinvasive approach mm -hmm. where you thrombolize the patient with a newer thrombolytic agent like tenecteplase mm -hmm. and then make an effort to shift him to a cath lab eligible hospital where you can offer him angioplasty to the culprit vessel and thereby prevent incidences of reocclusion and reinfarction. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your key. First of all, thanks for having me here and uh, you know hypertension is a very high uh, risk factor for morbidity and mortality and nowadays